Welcome to our second lecture covering chapter eight of our textbook. As you know, this chapter covers legally managing employees. It is the second of the two chapters in our textbook that are devoted to the employment relationship. <clears throat> in our first lecture, we talked about employment relationship generally. We talked about workplace discrimination as well as a special topic, sexual harassment. And we talked about the Family and Medical Leave Act. To, uh, in our second lecture today, we're going to talk about compensation. So let's go forward and talk about that. An important idea in the hospitality industry and most industries actually is the topic of the minimum wage. Many times people who work in the hospitality industry may um, have relatively um, uh, do not necessarily have a robust skill set that um, at least the marketplace recognizes as um, uh, qualifying a person for a high wage. And so many workers in the hospitality industry are going to start at at or around the minimum wage rate. The minimum wage is established by federal law. It um, is not indexed to inflation or anything like that. It requires an act of Congress in order for the um, minimum wage to go up. Currently, the minimum wage in uh, 2017 is $7.25 an hour for non-tipped employees. Um, again, there is no planned increase for the minimum wage, and it was increased um, not too distantly ago, um, and so we should be seeing this being the minimum wage probably for some time to come, although certainly that can change. And many states have a state minimum wage that is higher than the federal minimum wage. That is not the case in Texas. Typically, the minimum wage in Texas tracks very closely with the federal minimum wage. So usually, Texas employers need to focus upon complying with the federal minimum wage. The statute that establishes what the minimum wage is is called the Fair Labor Standards Act, more commonly referred to as the FLSA. This statute does a lot of things. For one thing, it is the federal law about child labor. We already talked about that in Chapter 7. But it is also the statute that establishes the minimum wage, and it also establishes how overtime is calculated. And under the FLSA, overtime begins on the 40th hour of work that a person has completed in a given week. And a week starts at 12.01 a.m. on Sunday morning and it concludes at 11.59 p.m. on Saturday night. So imagine for a second that I am, let me just get a little marker going here, I am paid $10 an hour. That's my normal uh, pay uh, rate. So I'm paid $10 an hour. And I work in a particular week 45 hours, and I am paying on an hourly basis, as we can see, based upon my calculation. So let's see how we figure that out, how we figure out what my pay ought to be. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate my straight time pay, which is the first 40 hours at $10 an hour. So we do 40 times 10. These are 40 hours, and this is $10. And we can see this works out to be $400. And now I need to calculate those five hours that I worked overtime. So that's all the hours over 40. So this will be at time and a half. So we take my hourly rate of $10 and we multiply this by time and a half times 1.5. And that, of course, works out in this case to $15 an hour. So that's going to be my over rate, overtime pay rate. And so for the five hours I have overtime, we'll do $15, which is my hourly rate for overtime, times five hours. And that works out to be $45. I'm sorry, not $45, $75, excuse me. $75, 15 times five. So for this particular week, I would earn 400 plus 75 for a grand total of $475. Obviously, this is gross. There will be withholding from this, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. That is how much I am due. If I happen to be working in a job in which I am paid on an hourly basis. The FLSA does not uh, 
have anything to do with um, how many hours an adult can work or um, let me go ahead and clear this nor does it put any limitations upon what the employer can require in terms of overtime hours. It simply establishes how the overtime pay will be calculated. Now there are certain workers who are not covered by the FLSA. We call these workers exempt workers, meaning they are exempt from the requirements of the Fair Labor Standards Act. For the most part, these folks are what we call salaried workers, meaning they earn the same pay each week whether they work 100 hours that week or they work one hour that week. Um, and their pay doesn't vary uh, based upon the number of hours they work. Typically, these individuals are managers or what we call managers, but there are some other positions that are also salaried. If a person works on an hourly basis, we call them non-exempt. This is kind of like a double negative. So we're saying this person is not one of the people who is exempt from the statute. So in other words, the FLSA applies to hourly workers, but doesn't apply to salaried workers. Um, like the federal law, Texas law does not require that employees have certain work breaks or have certain lunch breaks, and it doesn't limit the number of hours that adults can work. Uh, there are many states that do have these types of limitations, and so as you move to different locations, you shouldn't assume that the rule that we have in Texas applies in those particular locations. Okay, let's talk about the tip. As, as if you work in the hospitality industry, it's very likely that some of your employees will receive some of their compensation via a tip. And of course, a tip is a gratuity for a service performed. Now, the textbook wants to persuade you, I, I don't know if it's tongue in cheek or not, but wants to persuade you that tip stands for to improve service or maybe uh, to improve, I'm not sure what it is, but anyway, um, it is not that definition at all. TIP has a completely different connect, uh, uh, connection uh, etymology, and so that's a fun little way to think about it, but it's not at all the definition of the term. I won't test you on that one way or the other. If a person receives at least um, $30 um, a month in TIPs and um, with his or her tip in income actually reaches minimum wage if they are compensated $2.13 an hour by their employer, then they are eligible for the minimum tip rate. Now there's again uh, two things that have to happen. Number one, they have to be receiving, let me just flip it to the next slide, they have to be receiving um, at least $5.12 an hour on average in tip income. If they're receiving less than that, then uh, the, the total of the tip credit plus their um, tip hourly rate of $2.13 will make a total of less than $7.25, and tipped employees can't earn less than the minimum wage. So um, under those circumstances, the employer can't uh, get away with paying them just the $2.13. In addition, the employee has to at least earn $30 a month in tip. Now, of course, if the employee works very many hours at all, you can see as few as six hours, then this will uh, resolve that issue. But if a person works just a few hours, maybe three or something, then this could become a factor in whether they're eligible for the tip rate or not. The textbook has some incorrect information about the tip credit. Just so you'll know, you want to make sure that you're um, relying upon the information that I'm giving instead of the, uh, the typo in the textbook. So let me flip back here and make sure we covered everything. Okay, so um, again, the minimum wage for tipped employees is usually $2.13 an hour. Again, it's because of the tip income that's going to supplement. So of course, that, that difference here, the difference between the minimum wage and the tip minimum wage is that $5.12 an hour, and that's what we call the tip credit. It's the amount an employer is allowed to consider as a supplement to the employer paid wages to meet the minimum wage uh, level. This amount is going to change when the minimum wage goes up, um, so this isn't a static number necessarily. Let's talk about a service charge. This is another concept that's um, important. Um, uh, many times, uh, uh, hospitality businesses will have an automatic kind of tip built in. This might be, for example, when there's a large uh, gathering, maybe a table of eight or ten people in a restaurant, or it could be 
um, some other services being provided, that there is an automatic tip added to the amount of the bill. Under those circumstances, the patrons don't pay the tip directly to the waiter or waitress or bartender or whatever. Um, it is put automatically on the bill, so the employer actually handles that amount. Now, of course, that handles that happens with tips as well. Many um, customers choose to put the tip on the um, on the bill, and of course, that is also fine. Um, but that is a difference between a service charge and a tip. The, the tip is voluntary, and the tip is typically given directly to the um, employee, the, 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 the service provider. Many employers um, or many businesses, such as restaurants, will have a tip pooling process. This reflects the fact that while the waiter or waitress might be the primary contact that the uh, patron has with the um, with the uh, patron, um, and that may be how the the patron actually conveys the tip, conveys it directly to the, um, the waiter or waitress. There may be other people involved in providing important services who also are part of this tip system. Maybe the hostess, maybe the um, table busser, maybe the bartender. And so when you have a tip pool, um, the service providers all share the tips that they got and there'll be some uh, basis, some kind of equation that is being used for that purpose. Um, in some jurisdictions, tip pooling isn't lawful, but it is lawful in Texas. Um, if um, a company or if a hospitality business chooses to use tip pooling, um, then uh, it should be covered and explain to each employee who is participating in the pool so that he or she understands how the money will be divided and he or she should sign a consent form that, that uh, accurately describes that process. This is important because uh, disputes about wages um, are very difficult in many cases for employers to win, especially when the documentation isn't as it should be. Um, it's important to keep in mind that while tip pooling is lawful, it is unlawful for managers to participate in the pool for salaried folks to do so. So uh, be sure that you aren't um, engaging in that type of practice in your place of business. Another factor, of course, relating to compensation is how much withholding you're going to do. And there's lots of different types of withholding that can affect a person's paycheck. Obviously, one type of withholding is going to be the income tax. Um, employers obviously are required to withhold state and federal income taxes from the paychecks of employees. In Texas, we don't have a state income tax, so we don't have to worry about that, but we certainly do have to do the withholding for the federal income tax. And obviously, if you were to go to a different state, then there might be state, and there are even sometimes local income taxes that can be factors. Okay, so the first thing to keep in mind is that the employer isn't actually well, the employer is the entity that conveys the money to the IRS. The employer is actually not paying it out of its own money. It's taking the wages from the employee and then taking those those wages that it's not actually going to pay to the employee. It's going to kind of put in a separate bucket and he's going to convey that money to the IRS. Um, so it's actually money that the employee is prepaying or is paying um, at that time. And that amount is based upon what the employee um, elects. It's a combination of how much that employee happened to earn during that paycheck period, as well as the particular um, deductions and, and dependents that he or she has declared on the federal income tax a form that he has or she has submitted. Tips, of course, are wages, and so they are subject to um, income tax withholding as well. Um, and uh, they uh, kick in if it's over $20 per calendar month. Again, almost certainly going to meet this level. Now, sometimes you will encounter um, uh, people who are tipped, especially if they're tipped in cash, who may not want to volunteer the amount of tip. Perhaps they don't want to volunteer it because they don't want to uh, pay the relevant taxes on it. Um, it's the responsibility of the employer to monitor and to collect that information. It's good practice to have a daily tip log so that you have that documentation. The, the government doesn't care whether it's paid in cash or check or credit card. That amount of money has to be declared. Now, obviously, it's impossible for the employer to be looking over the, sh the shoulder of every single employee as he or she handles tips, but it is important that the employer 
uh, doesn't um, indirectly encourage or permit employees to underdeclare um, wages that they've got. That's a crime. It's a crime for the employee to do that. We certainly don't want to um, assist or encourage that type of behavior. Let's talk about FICA. Many people call FICA Social Security Taxes. FICA actually stands for Federal Insurance Contribution Act. Uh, but the reason it's called Social Security Taxes is because that's what it takes care of. It, it helps fund the Social Security system and also Medicare. Um, FICA works a little differently than the federal income tax, which is completely employee paid. Um, both the employee and the employer contribute to uh, FICA. In fact, they both contribute the same amount. And, and actually, the, um, uh, the employer can actually, in some cases, and contribute more. And again, um, these taxes are dependent upon the employee's wages, which again can include tips as well. Then we have FUTA. This is the Federal Unemployment Tax Act. That's what it stands for. This is something that employees don't pay for, but employers do pay for. And this, um, of course, again, requires that all in compensation, including tip income, fits into this. Uh, so this is one that you as an employer care about more than your employee. Let's talk about the earned income uh, credit. This is important uh, for many employees, especially in the hospitality industry, especially the ones who are relatively low, co lowly compensated. And they uh, can, can be eligible in many cases for um, the earned income tax credit, and this is a benefit to them to go ahead and take advantage of that. There's really two ways they can take advantage of it. One is they can wait to claim the credit when they file their federal income tax return um, in April. Um, but uh, another way of doing it, and there's definitely some advantage to this, is that they can submit an earned income credit advance payment certificate, a form um, W-5. You don't need to know the particular name of it, but you do need to know there's a process to do this. And this is a way for the um, worker to actually receive a portion of the credit um, before having to wait the whole year to get the credit. Um, if the employee chooses to use this form, then the employer is going to have to um, include that uh, payment in the paycheck of that particular worker. There's no requirement, though, that the employer police the accuracy of that employee's information. So even if the employee isn't eligible but submits the required paperwork, then the employer should work under the assumption um, that the employee is eligible. Obviously, the earned income credit is not something that the employer is really paying the employee. It reflects the, um, uh, the, the federal government uh, uh, allowance that the, the, uh, the credit that the is available. So it's not taking any money out of the employer's pocket whether or not the employee claims the earned income credit. It is a good idea if you have uh, low wage employees to let them know about this opportunity um, so that they can maximize their earnings um, and, and, and through getting taking advantage of this credit. This is a the next uh, item, the work opportunity tax credit, is a bit, another program that can be very advantageous for employers. It is a way for an employer to um, benefit the larger community by hiring individuals who uh, very much need employment and also benefit the employer. Um, these um, uh, are tax credits that the employer gets. Um, when the employer hires certain individuals, and these would include people with certain disabilities, people who get um, aid to dependent children, certain qualified veterans and ex-felons, also certain youths who live in certain communities, some summer, some, some summer workers, and food stamp recipients. And so this is a good practice to uh, seek out these workers so that you can uh, get some tax benefits from, from those place for those um, opportunities. So something to think, consider as you are recruiting um, and, and expanding your workforce. Okay, so that's the information that we have about, oops, went too far, about compensation. Now we're going to talk about managing employee performance. Um, most employers like to do an annual performance evaluation of their workers. Many times employers will choose to also have some kind of 
a performance evaluation at the 30-day or the 90-day point in the employment process. Many times this is called like a probationary period um, uh, to evaluate whether this employee should be retained or not. So this performance appraisal or performance evaluation um, can be called, or this is the definition the textbook provides, a review of an employee's performance including strengths and shortcomings. It is typically completed by the employee's direct supervisor. Sometimes it might be done by somebody in HR. Of course, that varies from organization to organization. Um, what, when you move up the ladder, it's pretty common for managers to ask their subordinates or their, their uh, the people in management positions to come up with the first draft of their performance appraisal to list uh, the specific uh, accomplishments that they had. Obviously, the manager is going to actually give a rating and, and decide uh, what to include and maybe exclude, but it's very common for that manager to first ask the employee to prepare that. As a result, it's a really good idea to keep a good record of everything that you, that you do. When you win an award, put it in a particular file so you'll remember it. When you meet a certain sales goal, put that in a particular file. Uh, keep a good record of all those details. Even when you don't meet a particular goal, I mean, it's a good idea to document maybe why you didn't meet the goal. Perhaps there was a bad storm uh, during that period of time, during that week or something, and that in, uh, caused your uh, restaurant to uh, not be as uh, busy because people were you know, staying at home because of the bad weather, that type of thing. Um, so there can be good reasons, and it's good to be able to document what those reasons are. So you definitely want to keep track of those things. This is especially important that during the beginning part of any appraisal period because it's going to be difficult for you to remember what you did 10 weeks or 10 months ago. Um, and so having that record is a really positive thing. The more specifics, the more positives you can put into that draft, um, the more likely it is that you're going to get a higher performance rating. And so it's really to your advantage to do that. Um, it would be awesome if in your professional career you had always wonderful managers who wanted to um, mentor you and guide you and encourage you and point you in the right direction and give you constructive feedback. I hope that you have that many times. Um, but the reality is that that's not always the case. Um, and so many times we need to, um, as a manager, develop our, ourselves somewhat independently of maybe our leadership, or at least uh, we may need to be more proactive than, than might be perfect. And you know, again, we can always wish for the perfect world, but it's also good to know how we can live in the world that we actually do have to live in. So I encourage you when you are, um, especially early on in the relationship, to be proactive, to seek feedback. Now, there's different ways to seek feedback, and certainly um, you'll want to consider the personality of your manager to decide what the most effective way might be. Um, certainly, you don't want to approach him or her when he or she is tired or grumpy or very busy. Uh, you don't want to approach him or her when there's other people present um, <clears throat> or when you've just made a big mistake or something like that. Um, so you want to be strategic about how you approach. Um, it's also a good idea when you approach not to say something like, how am I doing? Or am I doing a good job? That kind of thing. I mean, that's not a bad thing to say, but many times the response that you'll get won't be that meaningful. Sure, you're doing a good job. Yeah, yeah, you're fine. And you're not really getting a lot of helpful feedback. The reality is most managers don't like to give negative feedback. It's not fun. Um, they can all kind of imagine how it would feel if they were getting that feedback, even when it has the potential to really improve the performance of the person. Managers are reluctant to do it in part because it's uncomfortable to do. Sometimes they're reluctant to do it because they're concerned about the reaction the person might have. They're going to get mad. There's going to be an argument. There's going to be uncomfortableness. Da, 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 da. Sometimes they don't want to do it because they don't think it's really going to be effective. The person's never going to change. Why tell them what they're doing wrong? So there's some some roadblocks that can kind of get in the way. So as you're thinking through that, and of course you're going to know the personality of your manager, Think about the most effective way to get the candid feedback that you need. Because if you don't know what you're doing that the manager doesn't like, and you're always doing something, no person does everything right, right? I mean, sometimes it's not even something you're doing wrong. It's just what that person doesn't care for. Um, uh, 
uh, you you want to think about the right way of getting at that information and you might have to have that conversation a couple different times you might try one way and you end up getting nothing you're like okay well that didn't work let me try something else so here are some strategies that I encourage you to consider <clears throat> again pick the right moment when you and the manager are alone where things aren't frantic when there is some time to talk uh, perhaps it's uh, when you're if you're traveling in business, it might be over dinner uh, where y'all are just having dinner or lunch or whatever, and you're not necessarily focusing up on a business topic. You might say something like, what is something that I should be doing more of? Again, um, you know, and this is, this is a very easy thing. I mean, it's, it's a criticism to say, well, you should be doing more because I guess you should know that already, but it's saying I'm doing something. I think I'm doing something good now. What can I do more? What is that thing? And it might be, um, I, I like how you have a good, uh, interaction with your wait staff. I think you need to spend more time on the floor to even develop that further. Or I like the fact that you spend a lot of time training your bartenders about um, the latest drink fashions or whatever. Uh, but I think that you could even increase that. And that can be a good way of phrasing that. You don't say, is there anything I should be doing? You ask, what is something? Um, it's a, just a difference of phrase, but it's a huge difference in terms of the reaction that you're going to get. Is there anything is probably you're going to get a, no, you're doing great. Is there something I can do? And emphasize, is there something I can do? And you might even want to start by saying, listen, I know feedback is tough and, you know, it's uncomfortable for both of us, but I really want to be your best blah, 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 best supervisor, best manager, best whatever. And um, I would appreciate your candid feedback. What is something that I, that I need to be doing more of? Please let me know. Another is what is something that I should start doing? <clears throat> and you might even uh, float some ideas um, of things that you might start doing. Maybe things you've heard some of your coworkers in their same position are doing. Um, if you're not getting anything out, out of that. What is something that I should stop doing or should I should do less of? Those are some things to think about. Um, you know, what's something I'm doing that just kind of bugs you? <laughs> that could be a good way of putting it. I once had a manager who didn't like the way I signed my emails. I would sign things, thanks, and then my name, Cynthia Gruber. And he didn't like this. He's like, why are you saying thanks? I haven't done anything for you. You should say regards or something like that. It was a silly thing. There was nothing wrong with the way I signed my emails, or nothing, but it bugged him. So, gosh, of course I'm going to change it. Why do I want my emails to him to be a source of frustration? Um, I thanked him for that feedback, and guess what? I changed it. I now, don't, now do regards for virtually everyone because of that not so much because he was right but because he was the boss and it was a, a very small investment for me to make him a little bit happier and my guess is that when he saw that and he realized oh wow <laughs> I asked her to make the change and she did it then that makes him a little bit more open to giving me a next piece of, of feedback and so please do this um, pick your moments make sure it's a good time and you might even want to say listen would you mind thinking about this and, and maybe we can talk about it in, in a few days if, if that's convenient for you. And you're probably going to have to be the one to raise it. Hey, did you, were you able to think of anything about something um, that you'd like to see me do more of or whatever? <clears throat> now, certainly you can have these conversations during your appraisal and that's a smart time too, but I wouldn't restrict myself to those times. For one thing, you're only going to have the appraisal once a year. That's a long time to wait for feedback. And many times in today's industry, we're seeing so much change and so much turnover that um, it can be uh, too long to wait for that long. Another good time to do it is when you have a new supervisor come in or there's been a significant change in your job responsibilities. So those are some other options or some other times to think about it. Okay, let's talk about wrongful termination. Well, let's first of all talk about termination. Um, termination in this sense, of course, we're talking about dismissal or discharge. Um, the term wrongful termination is one of the most misunderstood terms that we deal with in, in, uh, in, uh, in the law, especially in the HR context. And that is, um, I can't tell you how many times people have said, I've been wrongfully terminated. And you know what? 
almost all the time when I've heard that, the person making that allegation, even if he or she were able to prove every single fact that he or she thinks is true, even under those circumstances, they would be um, unsuccessful in their lawsuit. Because even though they think that what, what happened was really unfair, really unwise, it's not unlawful. Unfair does not equal unlawful. Lots of things in life are unfair. Lots of things in the law are unfair. Lots of things in employment situations are unfair. That does not make it unlawful. So let's look at the definition of wrongful termination. A violation by an employer of the employment relationship resulting in the unlawful firing of the employee. Keep in mind that we work at an at-will employment uh, situation. We can be fired at any time for any reason, even an unfair reason, as long as it's not an unlawful reason. So I can't be fired because I'm a woman, but I can be fired because I wore a blue shirt to work. Sounds pretty stupid, right? But if the employer wants to fire everyone who's wearing a blue shirt and uh, women are wearing blue shirts and men are wearing blue shirts and uh, African Americans are wearing blue shirts and Caucasians are wearing blue shirts and Methodists are wearing blue shirts and Presbyterians are wearing, you know, if it's not, if it's not somehow or another a, a fake reason that is being used for discrimination, an employer can just randomly pick Okay, I'm going to fire you with, with, with a blue shirt on today. Or I'm going to fire everyone born um, in October or whatever. Um, it sounds silly, would be silly, but it wouldn't be unlawful unless it, there was some uh, um, illegal reason. So uh, wrongful termination is a much, much more narrow concept than most employees can think it to be. So let's talk about progressive discipline. This is something that's a really smart thing to have, and most larger employers are gonna have this kind of built into their um, HR system, but smaller employers don't necessarily have this, and so it's something to consider developing in your place of employment if you don't already have it. What is progressive discipline? Well, you can see in the word, it's some type of disciplinary system that progresses or increases. So this is when you provide increasingly severe consequences when a particular rule keeps on getting violated. Now the number of steps that you're going to have in your progressive discipline is going to vary. Uh, sometimes just by an employer, the employer is going to have a system set up with maybe two or three or four progressive disciplinary steps. And then, but even a particular employer is going to have certain offenses that perhaps result automatically in termination. For example, theft or a violence in the workplace. You're not gonna use progressive discipline under those circumstances. You're gonna fire somebody the first time that you're, able, you're persuaded that that has happened. And so uh, progressive discipline works for certain situations, but by no means every situation. When you provide the progressive disciplinary policy, you're probably going to have it maybe in your employee handbook or your employee manual, or you may present it at a meeting. You want to make sure at that time that you give yourself a, some wiggle room because you may decide certain times you're just not going to follow it. Um, you may uh, have a, a, an employee who has had a series of violations in lots of different areas and you're just done with them. You feel like he's just done so many things wrong and yeah he hasn't done this particular thing before and so normally you give this a person who does x some progressive discipline but not when they have 10 different things that they've done wrongly and they're progressive discipline for all of them so there might be some times that you don't follow the policy now whenever again you step away from the policy you want to make sure that you, you can justify your decision based upon whatever that extra factor is. You are more vulnerable to say a race discrimination or a sex discrimination claim if you haven't followed your policy strictly. But that's why you wanna give yourself some wiggle room in the state of policy and then you'll wanna challenge yourself. Can I really defend this logically? Why I'm treating Bob differently than my policy ordinarily provides? And you'll need to have some, some good reasons but it could be an option in, the, in, the, in certain cases. So here's an example of a progressive disciplinary policy. One would be to have a verbal warming. This is just one that you just tell somebody, and maybe you make a notation in your file reminded Bob about the dress code, and you put it on your day planner or something. Um, and then the next time when Bob is out of dress code, then you document the verbal warming. You tell Bob about it, but you also write it up in a formal document. You'll have it dated. You'll go over exactly what you said in a more formal manner.
if Bob continues to do that, then you'll have a written warning and you'll, you'll show that to Bob and you'll ask him to sign it as well. And in this document, you'll, you'll discuss what the next consequence will be if Bob continues on this path. And it might be a suspension. There might be a period of time where Bob is not going to work, maybe a week or a few days or maybe even longer, depending upon the particular issue. And then if the uh, the written warning doesn't take, you might well go to suspension if you have that as part of your program. And then the suspension doesn't take, you'll move to dismissal or termination. Now these are the five steps. This is kind of the classic way of approaching it. Um, I don't think too many employers, except maybe in union situations, actually have a five-step process. I've highlighted the three that are probably the most common. Uh, some employers will document every single verbal warning, and so they won't have an undocumented verbal warning. You know, it's difficult to have undocumented verbal warnings because if you have a large workforce, for, for, you might forget who you actually had a verbal warning with. And so um, as a practical matter, you might choose to document every verbal warning. It may, be, may not be something that the employee sees, but um, it would be something that you would have a record of. So you'd have one or the other of these, and then you move some kind of written warning. And again, there might be certain uh, violations that you move directly to written warning. And then you're probably going to move to termination. Most employers don't use a lot of suspensions unless it's against a union workforce where that's part of the, the process. This is a very good system, again, with perhaps taking out the suspension for uh, tardies and attendance issues that don't involve FMLA or Americans with Disabilities Act type issues. Also, these are good for productivity issues or for um, policy violations that aren't especially severe, like minor dress code issues um, or perhaps um, uh, some customer complaint issues that aren't severe, that are just kind of and not the best service in a particular day or something like that. Okay, so let's talk about how we should approach employee terminations. You're not going to be very long in a management position in the hospitality industry without having to dismiss somebody. Um, there's typically a fair amount of turnover in this industry, so you'll have workers who leave on their own, but then there will be times where you will need to sever the employment relationship yourself. And so as you enter into an employment relationship, I mean, you're hoping for the best, but you also need to be preparing for the worst. In a way, you always ought to approach your employees as, as somebody who you might need to fire at some point. I can remember a time where, um, uh, being an HR attorney, I, I also worked very closely with, with lots of people in, in various departments. And I can remember one time a, a man who was a buddy of mine to some extent, he told me, listen, Cindy, if you ever need to fire me, can you give me some warning? <laughs> and uh, we kind of joked about that. And I said, well, actually, I can't. I mean, I hope it never happens to you. But, you know, I'm not going to be able to, to do that because I, I can't. I have to treat the confidences of my client that way. And, and it's, always, it's always risky to become too friendly with um, your subordinates because it may well be that person needs to be someone you need to fire and sometimes it can be because there's a, a, a lack of work it may not be that person's fault at all or it can be that they um, made a poor choice and you know they didn't really mean it but that's something we fire people for um, so it's it's always useful to keep at least a certain level of social distance between you and your subordinates uh, so that you can be retain some level of objectivity and so that um, these situations can be handled as professionally as possible. Okay, so as you're trying to prepare for that termination that you, you are going to have to do, you'll want to make sure that you have all of your ducks in a row well before you get to the termination. You'll want to have conducted and documented all of those employee evaluations according to the schedule that uh, your employer has. You'll not only want to do those, but you'll want to make sure that they are candid and constructive. They aren't all positive uh, things. In fact, it would be rare that you would have an employee evaluation that is 100% positive. Um, we can all benefit from improvement, and so I would encourage you to document that when there are some opportunities for improvement. Uh, but it's more important, obviously, when there are significant problems, and you'll want to document those um, in those particular documents. You'll want to enforce all the policies and procedures and be consistent. Um, if Bob is getting a corrective or a disciplinary action because he's tardy a lot, you'll want to make sure that everybody else is in that situation who doesn't have a, a separate reason for that. 
um, is also being treated that way. And if you can't be consistent or decide not to be consistent, then you ought to be clear in your mind how you're going to be able to explain that inconsistency. And don't, don't repeatedly make uh, decisions to be inconsistent. That, that ought to be an unusual circumstance. You don't want to fire people because you're angry or you're having a bad day or um, things just haven't gone well. We all have those moments of, of frustration or, or um, uh, uh, things aren't just what we want. It's better to excuse that employee, uh, reflect upon it, get your, your documentation set up. You may well decide to dismiss that person anyway, but you will have had a moment or two to, or a day or two to get your thoughts together to make sure you have the correct documentation and to handle the termination in a professional manner. Um, if you don't already have that progressive disciplinary system, you'll want to have it and you'll want to use it consistently. You'll want to review all of the documentation relating to that employee before you terminate. There may be something in the file that you aren't aware of. Perhaps it was something that another manager covered or perhaps it's uh, some kind of documentation that you need to be aware of before making that decision. You'll want to conduct a termination review whenever you can where you meet with the employee um, and that you do an exit interview with the employee. Now, some employees aren't going to stick around for that. Um, they're, you, know, you can't force somebody, obviously, but you do want to do that face-to-face uh, -face unless there's some personal safety issue or something like that. Finally, you want to handle terminations in a confidential manner. Um, there may be something that happened that uh, the other workers are concerned about. Maybe they are concerned that this person might be a, a danger to them, or maybe they know about that there was a theft or something. Um, you'll, you'll need to be very careful about sharing any information because you can set yourself up for um, uh, various tort type claims if you share that information. Certainly the expectation ought to be that you will treat that person's situation uh, confidentially with a great deal of respect, even in a theft situation, even in a situation where you're going to be prosecuting the person. There's no need to add public humiliation to that. It's funny, there, there are cases out there where, where the, the termination was completely defendable, but the employer decided to make that person kind of the object lesson. Don't be like Bob. Don't do what Bob did. And Bob sued, and Bob sometimes gets big verdicts for that humiliation factor. And so you definitely don't want to single out Bob. You might choose to talk about hypothetical situations, but you'll have to really be careful so that it isn't a very thinly covered scenario relating to what really Bob did. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, in-house dispute resolution. Uh, the textbook spends a fair amount of space on this topic. I'm not really sure that it merits as much space as um, the author thought it, it merited. Um, these types of programs, these dispute uh, resolution programs, are quite common in union facilities and they can be used successfully in non-union facilities, um, but they aren't probably as common as maybe you might get the impression that um, the author wants you to have. So let's look at what an in-house. First of all, when we use the term in-house, we mean within the business. So th this, we're not getting a government agency involved. We're not getting the court system involved. This is simply within the organization. So what is it? Well, it's an employee funded by the, excuse me, a program funded by the employer that encourages the equitable settlement of employees' claim of unfair treatment prior to or without resorting to litigation. Again, this process is kind of like an appeals process. Let's say you've suspended a particular worker. He or she doesn't think that's fair, so you might have an appeals process to, to avoid that. Now, when I was at JCPenney, some of our units had this type of process. It is Where it's adopted outside of a union system, it's usually done to, um, to appeal to employees so that they are less likely to support unionization. So it can be a, a way to keep a workplace union free. <clears throat> so why do employers choose to have this? Um, well, one is because employees can feel that it's very positive. They feel like they have their voice in the system. It can save money for employers in that the employers um, are going to perhaps have less litigation. Um, it can resolve the complaints in a relatively time, timely way. So. 
uh, certainly quicker than than say a lawsuit would be. Uh, depending upon how these cases are handled, they can be handled very confidentially. They can also not be so confidential because there can be can be the talk of the the workplace that that these types of cases are going forward. Um, it can help to preserve work place relationships sometimes and as they make the, the, the situation worse and as they make the situation better. And again, there can be some reduced legal exposure for the employer um, insofar as that this process in, in, is in place and works. And as I said before, I don't, this on this, I don't have this on this list, but it can help persuade employees that a union, uh, that the union isn't necessary to ensure um, uh, workplace uh, fairness. Okay, ombudsperson. This used to be ombudsman, but now I guess because we want to be more um, open to the fact that both men and women can have this role. Um, this is a company official who investigates and resolves worker complaints. So he's or she's a kind of a troubleshooter. Uh, even though he or she works for the company, he or she tries to be like Switzerland. Um, uh, looking at the situation from both perspectives, trying to reach a sensible solution to this. Again, this is common in um, a union facilities to have somebody who has this type of role. So what are some things that we see in these types of programs? Well, oftentimes the employees are involved in developing it. Now, I'll be honest with you, there are some really dangerous aspects to having employees involved in this. Um, some of them have to do with the National Labor Relations Act, kind of be on the, the course of this, the scope of this course to talk about exactly what uh, the challenges are. I would not, though, have employee input in the development of the program unless you've talked with a labor attorney to see if um, the type of involvement that you're imagining is going to be lawful. It can be illegal and there can be serious repercussions. So sometimes it's better to just develop the program without input from employees. You'll need to have some level of training for the mediators or if you happen to have employees directly involved for the employees themselves. And sometimes you might even provide legal assistance for employees. Again, that's completely optional. It certainly doesn't have to happen. Um, many times there will be levels of appeal for this system and so you have to consider um, what that appeal process might look at look like and who might be involved in it. Let's talk about employment, unemployment claims. Um, uh, we're all, I guess, familiar with the concept of unemployment claims, but let's talk about the idea of unemployment insurance. This is a program that the employers pay into, and this provides for um, money payments to employees who have lost their positions um, through no fault of their own. That is the idea. Um, typically, um, employees receive a portion, I think it's about uh, two-thirds of their income, um, while they are um, looking for another position, and it typically continues for about six months. During that period of time on unemployment, they have to be actively seeking um, employment in their particular industry, and they have to prove that they've made these particular um, applications. So an employer is... You might think, well, an employer, once the employee-employee employer relationship has been severed, an employer doesn't really care what that employee does, right? Well, um, it, it actually, the employer does care because the employer is going to have an experience rate. Um, the, the unemployment insurance system, and some of them, they're set up lots of different ways, but they recognize that there are certain employers who fire people all the time. And there are other employers who rarely fire people. And so it makes sense for the, the company who's constantly firing people to pay a higher insurance rate than the company who rarely fires people. It's a little bit like Bob, who's in a car accident every other week, versus Larry, who's never in a car accident. Who's gonna have the higher insurance rate? Well, obviously Bob. So as a result of this distinction, employers have a lot of interest in making sure that when they terminate somebody, that person is probably not going to be eligible for unemployment benefits. Now, there are times that employers are kind of stuck. They're going to have to uh, acknowledge that this person is eligible for benefits. For example, when you lay people off, when you just don't have enough work for them, obviously that's not the fault of that person, so therefore you're going to... Uh, 
have uh, that's going to hit your experience rating and it's going to go up and in the future you're going to have a higher percentage of your uh, payroll that's going to uh, go towards this tax or not this tax this insurance premium um, but when you terminate someone because they're not doing a good job you'll want to to the extent that you uh, truthfully can characterize that as misconduct related to work so for example imagine that uh, uh, Peter has uh, was caught stealing from from your business where well, obviously you're going to fire him and you are going to when he files for unemployment if he ever does you're going to contest that you're going to present evidence to the uh, hearing referee saying hey you know Peter stole from us that was misconduct related to work yes he's not employed by us anymore that's certainly true but he's not entitled to unemployment because he caused his own unemployment um, that's a pretty clear case if you can prove that Peter stole from you yes your your experience rate is not going to change other things like Peter wasn't productive at work or Peter was insubordinate or Peter was late to work um, that's going to vary uh, depending upon your hearing referee also what part of the country you're in and how strong your facts are sometimes you'll win those cases sometimes you won't win those cases um, but it's a, a good idea to generally um, uh, oppose those cases that you can truthfully uh, contest what is an un unemployment claim? Well, it's a petition. Again, this is submitted by the unemployed worker, and they are asserting that they're eligible for the unemployment benefits. Um, and, and essentially, they're saying, "I was not dis. I'm dis. I was. I, I w didn't resign. I was involuntarily separated. That's another requirement. And I did not engage. I was not dismissed because of my misconduct related to work." So again, they weren't stealing, they weren't fighting at work, they weren't being insubordinate work, those types of things. And I guess just because they filed this claim doesn't mean that the employer can't contest that claim. Okay, let's talk about employment records and retention. Um, this is a really complex issue, um, a, a specifically what records you have to keep, what format you have to keep them in, and how long you have to keep them for each worker. Um, typically, larger companies are going to give you some detailed guidance about these particular documents. Uh, many times, the companies will actually keep the, this data <clears throat> in electronic form. But some of these types of data, sometimes it's, you can't keep them in electronic form. You have to keep them in paper form. Now, this isn't true in Texas, but many states you have to actually have the work permit for minor workers who work in your facility. So um, making this up, we'll say that's a rule in Florida. Um, you actually need to have that piece of paper from that high school in that particular business, not in a central location, but actually at that particular location. It's not enough that you've scanned it in and you have an electronic version. So knowing all the ins and outs, all those details um, is can be tricky, but you need to make sure that you have those records. And you also need to make sure that you are retaining it to the length for the length of time that you need to. Here are some examples of required posters that are out there. Um, we need to have the Fair Labor Standards Act poster. Again, this is the one that establishes the minimum wage, the overtime uh, calculation method, and the child labor uh, requirements. The EEOC, or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, is the organization that uh, prohibits uh, discrimination based upon age, race, uh, color, religion, disability, sex, um, and all those other categories, I might have listed them. Also, retaliation, um, and that has a poster. We also OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. They have rules about how we keep our workers safe in the environment. Of course, this, by the way, is important in a hospitality industry because, you know, in in a restaurants, we'll, we have people using knives. We have people. Um, using um, fire, uh, lots of risks here. Um, and so there are obviously very specific rules about uh, how that needs to be maintained and there's a poster about it. Um, but all employees have, all employers have to have all these posters. Then there's also uh, the Employee Polygraph Protection Act. As a general rule, you should never, ever, 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 ever polygraph an employee. While in theory, it is legal, it is possible to legally polygraph an employee um, unless you are in a position that your workers have to 
um, have like government security clearance or something like that, it's almost never a good idea. But I would say it is never a good idea to polygraph um, or to rely upon the results of the police polygraph test. But anyway, you need to have the poster with respect to this. You also need to have the Family and Medical Leave Act poster, and there will almost certainly be state posters that you need. A good option here is to get an all-in-one poster that has all of these federal posters on one document. Um, and um, that makes it easier because, it, you, as you can imagine, all these posters, it's hard to keep track of, do I have the latest edition of it? Do I have them all up? Um, it can become a, a logistical issue. And on top of that, to maintain your particular state posters can be tricky. So the way the all-in-one posters work is there's an all-in-one federal, and there's an all-in-one state for your particular state. Um, and so usually once a year, you'll get a new version of it, because um, oftentimes there will have been some little tweaking of some of the language on the posters. You don't have to buy the all-in-one posters. They're not usually expensive. You can usually probably get both for... Um, ballparking about $50 or something like that. You'll want to have these posters in two locations in your facility. One is where applicants uh, are typically going to come. This may be uh, the reception area or a place where they complete applications or something like that. And then you also want to have them in a place where your employees regularly congregate. This may be near the time clock, if you have lockers, that, that location, uh, perhaps near the employee bathroom. It could be a break room that you have. Um, it could be that those two locations I just described really are just one location. And so in that case, you just need one location. But if you try to keep your applicants in separate areas from your employees, then you would need to have two locations for it. And you want to make sure you have these. Failure to have these posters up can result in automatic fines, some of them a day, $100 a day. And you can imagine if there's several of them that are missing, you can start seeing some pretty significant fines. It's actually pretty rare for employers to actually, or excuse me, for government agencies to actually fine people for not having the posters. But it is definitely evidence that can go in front of the jury when there's an alleged violation of the law. Because the argument is, hey, the employer didn't even, obviously is more inclined to violate the law because they didn't really care enough about the law to put up their required poster. And maybe they intentionally cut the poster to let down because they didn't want the employee to know that the law was being violated. So it becomes a very bad fact and you just don't want to be in that position. Are your employees going to read these posters? Very unlikely that they will, but you do need to have them up. Let's talk about workplace surveillance. Um, um, generally speaking, um, things happen in the workplace that are of great interest to employers. Employees can steal things. Employees can have contraband like drugs or alcohol on premises um, or weapons. Um, they can be engaging in inappropriate behavior, um, sending email, yeah, emails with dirty jokes or things like that. And, and these are all things that employers are legitimately concerned about. But there are some countervailing concerns. One is that employees um, don't like to be constantly monitored. It's an uncomfortable feeling. Uh, to feel like uh, every step you take is being monitored and checked. Um, and so you, you, peop, uh, employees can start feeling uncomfortable when they don't really have any kind of zone of privacy. Um, also, there can be legal issues. Um, if you uh, start doing random bag, bag checks, for example, and you haven't told people they might be subject to random bag checks, um, they, people might have what's called a reasonable expectation of privacy. And so you have violated that expectation by um, having this, this new policy that you haven't alerted the individuals to. And uh, there have been cases where employees have gotten pretty significant judgments in these cases. There was actually a fairly big case in this area in the state of Texas. So this is an area that we do need to be somewhat concerned about. So here are some strategies to think about as we approach these areas. One is think about why you care. What are you worried about being in the locker or in the purse or in the 
um, the desk or in the voicemail or the email. Now, you may be responding to a particular issue that's just come up or you may be concerned about a particular thing that is out there happening in the community. So once you figure out why you want to, then think about how you can accomplish that goal. Um, one thing that, that was a, a pretty common thing that, that I've seen that some employers do is um, if you allow people to bring, say, a bag to the work area, you might, you might issue them a bag that's clear. And so it can be very obvious whether they are stealing from you because you can look in the bag. Um, it's a bag that doesn't belong to the employee, so they can't really have a reasonable expectation of privacy about it. Plus, even if they did, I mean, it's a see-through bag. Obviously, there's no privacy associated with it. But by giving them the bag, you're allowing them to have something that they may want to have with them. Maybe they want to have their bottle of water. Maybe they want to have their lunch. Um, maybe they want to have a little bit of cash to use in the vending machine or they need feminine hygiene products or something like that. You've given them the opportunity to have what they need, but you are also uh, stopping stuff from getting in there that you may not want to have in there. So think about how can I do it in a way that is less intrusive but still is going to accomplish my goals. This next step is really important. It's probably the most important is you've got to tell the employees about the surveillance that you're going to do and you need to make it clear and you need to be consistent about it. So you ought to say, hey, you know what? We're going to start random bag checks. We may not do it every day. We may not check everyone's bag, but we're going to have some system of bag checks. Now, if you do these types of bag checks, you want to make sure you're not singling out people of a particular ethnicity or a particular race or a particular religion or a particular gender. Um, have some system. Maybe you decide, okay, today we're going to check every fifth person's bag or, you know, whatever the thing is. And you need to consistently do it. You don't have to do it every Tuesday. You might do it, you know, twice a week, randomly selected days. Um, if you stop doing it entirely for a while, before you can restart, you're going to have to remind people again. There may be new people that have, weren't there when you made the initial announcement. Uh, plus, people, if they've got, you've gone several weeks without having it, they may have developed a reasonable expectation of privacy and you want to disabuse them of that notion. Uh, it sounds mean, but it's actually in your interest. If they don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, you can't violate it. And so therefore you are significantly reducing your risk. Um, when you communicate this policy, it's good to do it in writing and it's good to get the employee's acknowledgement. Some employees may not like the policy, probably, probably most of them or perhaps all of them won't like the policy, um, but it's fine for you to make that a condition of continued employment. Again, we're not talking about cameras in the bathroom or, you know, uh, having people undress or anything like that. Um, those would be unreasonable policies, but we're talking about checking lockers. If the employees have lockers, checking the contents of their desks or their office, checking their purses or their pockets um, or, or their bags, checking the voicemail or the email of systems that the company is providing. Those are the types of things. Again, the rules in this area can vary significantly by state to state, and many times they are driven by the common law, by judge-made decisions. And so there is a certain level of uncertainty about where the law might be at any particular time. So again, as you're, if you're rolling out a particularly intrusive policy in this area, you may want to run it by a, an employment attorney to make sure that your particular jurisdiction is going to think that that behavior is, is okay for an employer to do. I hope that this uh, lecture has been helpful for you. Of course, as always, if you have any questions about the material, please feel free to email me. Also, come by my office hours if you'd like to talk about this material in more detail. I look forward to seeing you. I hope that uh, you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye-bye. Here we go.